Hi, Dr. Mirko, can you hear me? Hi, I can hear you okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. So okay. you will be covering the first part, and then we're going to try to solve the uh, tech issue with Dr. Rogers so that she can start the second part. Yeah, sure. I'm, uh, I think... Alexi, I'm going to be interpreting you, and uh, you should know I was called very ad hoc to this meeting. I was not planning on it, but I'm substituting for another interpreter. So I don't know even the topic, but I am, uh, well, I, I, I am knowledgeable in psychology and CBT and different types of therapy. So thank you. That was short info for me. Hi, everybody. Uh, Alexey, how are you? Привет. Hi, my наушники не работали. I'm sorry, my head. Um, Crystal, are we starting now? Yeah? The webinar has started. We're just waiting for the interpretation to start. Oh, and Crystal, can I just check? Should I start sharing the slides and uh, presenting or to wait a few minutes till Dr. Rogers is able to log in? Uh, you can. You can start, and we'll see how things will go with Dr. Rogers. Okay, okay, okay. You can just let her know that I, I had to use my personal email. I wasn't able to use the university email to log in, so maybe that will help. But okay, I will let her know. Thank you. Sure, but okay, I'll share the screen and I'll start. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, can then can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, uh, well, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you very much for attending uh, today's session. Um, I'm very glad to be able to share with you some of the um, latest findings and advances in research on restricted and repetitive behaviors uh, in autism. Uh, so my name is Mirko Darovic. I'm a um, senior research fellow in the School of Psychological Sciences at Melbourne University. Um, and for today, we'll have a, a, a joint presentation. So I will cover um, the first uh, half an hour to 40 minutes. Um, and I will cover the history, classification, and structure of restricted and repetitive behaviors. Um, I, will, I will discuss a little bit in terms of um, whether we should think uh, about repetitive behaviors as being uh, specific or unique to autism, as opposed to maybe being seen um, across different conditions uh, before moving to discussing trajectories um, and mechanisms of different repetitive behaviors, um, different types of repetitive behaviors. And I will close um, with some discussion um, in terms of uh, how best to assess these behaviors um, and how uh, best to assess them for different purposes. And then following my presentation, um, Professor Rogers, will cover um, aspects of management or uh, treatment of restricted and repetitive behaviors. Um, so uh, before I start, um, I'm currently based in Melbourne, Australia. So as you can, um, as you can see on, the, <laughs> on this improvised map, um, Melbourne is quite far away from anywhere on, on earth. <laughs> So it's currently 1.30 uh, a.m. or 1.30 in the morning here. So um, I timed the talk uh, during the day, but hopefully um, hopefully, I'll still be able to stick to the schedule, relatively speaking. Um, and secondly, as you can see on the photos, we have a Swiss Shepherd dog. So in, he can be a little bit vocal. So in case you hear some odd noises um, in the background, um, yeah, he's the, he's the one to blame. Um, so for, just before I move on to, on to the content of the talk today, I'd really like to um, um, acknowledge the contributions of uh, my colleagues, uh, collaborators and mentors over the years, uh, without whom um, the work uh, would not be possible. And these people have also really contributed an uh, immense body of knowledge to um, our understanding of repetitive behaviors in autism. Um, Dr. Mirka, sorry for interrupting yeah. you. 
no, can I remind no the interpreters? Uh, hello, Donna Summers. Uh, interpreters, please record your voice. Thank you so much. Oh, great. Shall I just continue? Yes. Sorry okay. for interruption. No, no, no worries at all. Um, so, okay, got um, it. Yeah. Okay, ju just, uh, yeah, I guess just moving on to um, providing some historical context about uh, restricted and repetitive behavior. Behaviors. So the class of behaviors that um, uh, we today recognize and label as a, a restricted and repetitive pattern of behaviors in interest. And just for the sake of simplicity, I'll refer to them as RRB, uh, which is a much, much easier abbreviation to use. Uh, was uh, first described almost 80 years ago um, in clinical observations by Leo Kenner. Um, so the first person to formally, um, at least um, in general literature, um, describe autism, um, and Leo Kenner considered them to be the key feature of autism. And this is really the opinion um, that has not changed to this day when um, RRB are recognized as a core symptom domain of autism across a uh, different incarnation of international diagnostic systems, um, including DSM-5 and ICD-10 and 11. Um, and also when we know that uh, repetitive behaviors are among the earliest infant predictors of subsequent autism diagnosis. Um, the other aspect that's really important to highlight is that um, in addition to highlighting the pervasiveness and phenotypic complexity of repetitive behaviors um, and putting forward one of the first hypotheses um, about the underpinning mechanisms of these behaviors, um, Leo Kenner also noted a negative impact that many of these behaviors might have on the quality of life and well-being of, of uh, children with autism, but also on their uh, parents and broader uh, family system. Um, and this is a, really an insight that has been replicated and has also been further extended across subsequent studies that have uh, consistently shown that certain repetitive behaviors can be disruptive for people with autism their parents and broader family system um, as they can uh, present a major barrier um, to subsequent learning and adaptation. Um, and they can also lead to externalizing problem um, and be associated with parental stress. However, uh, what I would like to emphasize is that not all repetitive behaviors have negative impact, um, nor should they be the focus of treatments. Um, this is something that both Professor Rogers in her presentation and I will be discussing later on um, during, the, uh, during the talk uh, today and, and we'll be happy to answer any questions at the end. Um, so given the um, diagnostic significance and clinical impact, um, it would, would have been um, expected that our field uh, has, at least metaphorically speaking, uh, tick the both second and the third bo box of knowledge that you can see on this slide so that we have a detailed uh, understanding of why repetitive behaviors occur um, and that we have developed effective treatment options. Unfortunately, that's really not the case. Um, and what's fair to say is that until very recently or fairly recently, relative to research on social functioning or social phenotype of autism, um, research on definition, cause, capacity for change of repetitive behaviors has been negatively, um, has been relatively neglected. And as a result of this, um, effective individually tailored treatments for repetitive behaviors are um, currently missing. Um, just to, after having situated repetitive behaviors in terms of the history, in terms of the current body of knowledge, um, it's important to now transition to um, how we classify um, and understand the structure of repetitive behaviors. As, as you all know, and, and also as you have seen from the list of behaviors that Kenner has described on the, um, one of the first slides, and as you can see here, repetitive uh, behaviors and cost encompass a really broad and diverse set of behaviors. And by now, um, it is widely accepted in our field that repetitive behaviors are best conceptualized or should be best conceptualized 
has multi-dimensional domain that encompasses several distinct yet related subdomains. So in order to understand how to best classify repetitive behaviors and understand the structure, we have conducted a systematic review of factor analytical studies. So what we refer to as, um, and apologies if, if this is a common knowledge in the audience, um, but just, uh, um, just to kind of expand a little bit, what we uh, tend to um, consider factor analysis is a statistical method that looks at large number of behaviors and then groups them into smaller number of subgroups or factors based on common characteristics among those behaviors. Um, so what we have done is that we uh, again have uh, conducted a systematic review. We have identified 38 studies that attempted to uh, classify repetitive behaviors or understand the structure. Um, here on the left hand side, you can see just some of the instruments. Um, and um, on the right hand side now you can see um, that there are three factors or types of repetitive behaviors that have emerged fairly consistently. Um, so repetitive motor behaviors um, have emerged uh, in 36 out of uh, 38 studies. Um, insistence on sameness has emerged um, almost ubiquitously. Um, and in addition, we have a circumscribed interest that have uh, emerged in um, slightly um, above third of the studies. Um, importantly, um, although these, uh, the uh, three subgroups or types of repetitive behaviors that you can now see on the left-hand side have emerged the most consistently, um, sensor-related fascinations and stereotype or repetitive language were also identified across several studies. Um, and importantly, um, the circumscribed interest, um, which is usually considered as a um, single domain, has bifurcated or further divided into two subdomains. The so first one is the one that we refer to as restricted interests. So those are the interests that in terms of their focus or topic are not unusual. Um, but what is distinctive about them is that they're very intense, um, inflexible, um, and very um, time consuming for an individual. So that's the first type. And the second type is unusual interest. So what do we mean by that is that those are the interests that are not commonly seen outside of autism. So fascination with traffic signs, um, timetables, um, and things like that. And we'll touch on that um, a little bit more um, later in the talk. So the question is, why is it really important to understand the structure of repetitive behaviors? Um, why would we do all these studies? Well, the reason why it's really important is that reliance on broad or poorly defined uh, types of repetitive behaviors um, that conflate distinct uh, subtypes can really cloud our ability to understand uh, mechanisms of these behaviors. Um, and importantly, and specifically related to interventions, um, distinct types of repetitive behaviors will respond differently to different treatments. So if a, if a child presents with a one type, um, they should be it's, it's one uh, over the other uh, treatment that should be appropriate. So that's why it's really important to understand um, the structure of which of these behaviors are actually valid. Um, so second important question to consider, as I mentioned at the beginning, is whether repetitive behaviors are something that is specific or, uh, or unique to autism, or it, is it something that's, um, that can be seen across different populations? So as you can see on this slide, um, and uh, I've also uh, put a, um, a review that we have done um, quite, a, quite a long time ago now, at the, at the beginning of my PhD, um, is that um, repetitive behaviors actually, in addition to autism, occur across a number of neurodevelopmental um, and neuropsychiatric conditions. Um, so for instance, just very briefly and quickly, um, as you can see on this slide, um, and you can see the reference of the paper that we published in the American Journal of um, Medical Genetics. We looked at repetitive behaviors in people with P10 mutations, and we found that even the ones who don't have autism um, actually show um, significant level of um, repetitive behaviors, and they actually show significant level of different types of repetitive behaviors. Um, importantly, 
um, as I um, as you've seen in the previous slide, um, the repetitive behaviors are not only seen in um, clinical conditions; they're actually seen in normative development as well. So early in child development. Um, so on the left hand side, you can see a bit of a scheme um, that's based on really pivotal paper by Easter Tillen um, from 1979. So she has described um, a range of different uh, motor stereotypes um, that typically developing children. So children who, has who have no diagnosis and will never develop any diagnosis engage during the first 12 months. Um, to kind of expand on this uh, point a little bit more, um, we have actually conducted a longitudinal study um, where we had looked at um, how different type, types of repetitive behaviors change over time during the first year, uh, six years of life of typically developing children. Um, so on the left hand side, you can see that repetitive motor behaviors uh, start at a fairly high level when children are aged 12 to 15 months. Um, and that is followed by that is followed by a steep decrease. So by the level of um, um, even 24 months, they're fairly, fairly low. Um, on the other hand, insistence on sameness starts uh, very low um, at age of 12 to 15 months. Um, then they um, steeply increase, um, reaching their maximum between 24 and 48 months, and then following um, a gradual decrease. Um, so I will come back to, the, to why it's really important to uh, refer uh, to the uh, normative development in order to understand the mechanisms. Um, but the broader point when we, when we think about repetitive behaviors um, as something, uh, as whether it's something which is specific or not to autism, um, what we can conclude is that it is actually the frequency, pervasiveness, and severity of repetitive behaviors rather than their form or pattern that distinguishes autism from other clinical groups and normative development. In other words, there is not a single uh, pathognomonic, pathognomonic or specific repetitive behaviors that you can point out and say, aha, we only see this in autism, we don't see this anywhere else. Um, so um, just uh, switching gears a little bit, um, after having uh, covered the classification, um, and then uh, a bit of history about repetitive behaviors and, and you know, like a little bit about the agnostic aspects. Um, now it would be good to turn to um, trying to um, present to you um, la latest findings in terms of the trajectories um, and mechanisms of different main types of repetitive behaviors. Um, so turning to that, is we'll touch first on repetitive motor behaviors. So here you can see on the slide uh, some examples uh, that this uh, domain encompasses. Um, and as you can see from the figure um, at the bottom, um, these behaviors tend to uh, be highly prevalent in younger children, uh, but somewhat less prevalent in older children. These are children, these are individuals with autism. Further, they tend to be associated with lower IQ, um, so cognitive functioning or developmental level. Um, and they also tend to be associated with more um, severe or more um, with more difficulties in social and communication functioning. Um, so if you now go back um, to the slide that I showed previously or a figure that you can now see on the right hand side, hopefully. Um, where we looked at the pattern of repetitive motor behaviors in normative development, what we can really um, observe is that um, uh, what we can see is that there is somewhat similar trend in autism and normative development. Just that the overall severity obviously in autism is much higher from the beginning um, and their reduction is much slower. However, um, as in normative development, they also tend to reduce uh, with time. Thus, these behaviors can be thought of as uh, sometimes really being appropriate for a person's developmental level, even when their chronological age is higher. So if you have a person who is 11, um, but their um, developmental level is two, 
um, it is really not surprising that they might show some of some of the repetitive motor stereotypes because that's what you would expect um, from a typically developing child who is two. Further, um, what is also really uh, important to emphasize that in early normative development, it has been suggested that repetitive motor behaviors um, have an important role um, in regulating arousal through sensory motor feedback. And there is some evidence to suggest that this might also be the case in autism. For instance, um, there is a robust um, evidence um, that um, um, repetitive motor behaviors are associated with atypical sensory features across a number of studies. Um, uh, further, um, there has been a few physiological studies that have, that have shown that um, engaging in repetitive motor behaviors can increase or decrease arousal based on physiological parameters. Um, and finally, um, what has also been shown is that um, people with congenital blindness or uh, hearing impairments can also engage in some of these behaviors as a way of increasing um, or decreasing the levels of arousal. Finally, um, and we can all relate to this, um, sometimes in situations of stress, people tend to show certain motor stereotypes. For example, um, um, tapping fingers or leg swinging. So um, what, in terms of the brain um, basis, um, what we see is that there are structural and fun functional atypicalities in a specific circuits um, that are responsible for um, that are responsible for noted functions. So basically, they're responsible for regulating arousal. So what what is really um, key message here is that um, in in autism, um, a lot of motor stereotypes actually can have adaptive role, and the role, uh, the role can be for a person to regulating their levels of arousal and sometimes reducing stress. Um, so it's really important when uh, we are considering whether these behaviors should be intervened on or not, um, is to consider um, whether they're actually uh, negatively impacting the person or not. So Professor Rogers will cover this, this in a little bit more detail, um, but I guess um, as a default, they would, you wouldn't necessarily need to reduce these behaviors because they might be helpful for a person. Um, so as long as they don't uh, cause any additional um, issues, um, they, they don't necessarily need to be um, focus of the treatment. Um, so moving on um, to the um, um, insistence on sameness behaviors, um, as you can see on this slide, um, is, is uh, how they change over age. Um, so again, as we did, we've done to re with repetitive motor behaviors, we can compare the um, the trajectory. Um, and as we have seen previously, um, the trajectory that we see in autism seems to resemble uh, what we see in normative development. But again, um, insistence on sameness is more severe and reduction is much more protracted um, and then follows by stability um, after a certain period of time. Um, so what is important to consider is why we see um, described developmental sequence in normative development um, and why we don't necessarily tend to see as much of a reduction in autism. Well, in normative development, as you can see um, some text on this slide, there is a similar developmental sequence for insistence on sameness and normative fears. In other words, when insistence on sameness behaviors start to emerge during the normative development and start to be really noticeable, that's where children tend to uh, develop uh, what we call normative fears. So fear of the dark, fear of the unknown and things like that. Importantly, as you know, everyone who had a child can, uh, can attest, um, insistence on sameness behaviors um, can be particularly likely to occur at times of transition. For example, bad time. Um, they can be accompanied by uh, these normative fears. Um, so children might insist for parents to read them the, um, a story or, um, many, many times before um, they eventually are happy to go to sleep. Um, and these are typically developing children. Um, so what has been suggested that um, insistence on sameness is really a rudimentary form of, or serves as a rudimentary form of self-regulation. 
So it serves as adaptive strategy for managing fears by exerting control over the environment um, and reducing uncertainty and unpredictability. Um, so they're actually quite, quite adaptive early in development. However, uh, why and how these behaviors that, as I mentioned, can be quite adaptive and they're transient, um, then transition to be potentially maladaptive in autism. Um, well, again, it's important to consider um, at which point they, they reduce um, in, in general development. So um, the typical peri period where both insistence on sameness and normative fears begin to reduce um, corresponds with the period in the development where self-regulation abilities and maturation of underpinning brain circuitry really starts to blossom, so to speak. So in normative development, as self-regulation abilities tend to develop, become more complex, more effective, um, and also uh, uh, less rigid, they tend to replace sameness in, uh, as a way of um, managing uncertainty, which then leads to reduction in normative fear and anxieties. However, in autism, um, we know that anxiety is from the get-go quite high, and we also know that people with autism have problems with different aspects of self-regulation. Um, so the, the hypothesis that we and others have put forward is the reason why we see um, insistence on sameness as being very high um, and uh, consistent in autism is because um, they are more anxious um, and they also have de uh, delays in um, self-regulation uh, development. So therefore, they tend to continue relying on insistence on sameness as a way of regulating um, or avoiding um, anxiety and fears and managing uncertainty. However, uh, because insistence on sameness by definition is not flexible, um, in the long run, it can actually perpetuate anxiety because um, it's a classical avoidance. So if a person is continuously trying to control the environment, um, that's not always possible. So in situations when it's not possible to control the environment, anxiety can occur and can be quite severe. Um, so we have uh, tested this theory through um, or across uh, several studies. So we, what we have found is that, um, firstly, anxiety was uh, highly associated with insistence on sameness, and this link seemed to be specific to insistence on sameness. In other words, um, anxiety is not as related to repetitive motor behaviors. Um, and on the left, on the right hand side, um, you can see what we call a mediation model, where we saw that um, lower levels of cognitive control and high levels of anxiety work together um, to lead to insistence on sameness. Um, there is also imaging uh, findings to support this theory. So what we tend to find is that there are structural and fu functional atypicalities um, in caudate and also lateral prefrontal cortex. So these are the brain areas that are included in um, different aspects of self-regulation. Um, so um, just a little bit um, to expand on that, how could this be, um, how this could this actually be useful for us in terms of thinking about interventions? Well, um, self if we hypothesize that self-regulation and anxiety are the uh, mechanism that are leading to insistence on sameness, then they might be a viable uh, targets um, for the purpose of reducing insistence on sameness. Um, and indeed, there are some approaches that have been shown outside of autism to be useful for developing flexibility and compensatory strategies. Um, and you can see a little bit of information here. So some of them work at the level of um, um, emotional self-regulation, some of them work more at the level of cognitive self-regulation. Um, however, it's really important to emphasize that um, there hasn't been direct tests of these, um, these treatments in autism, um, and there hasn't been a really direct test of how effective they are. So that's really, um, really a next frontier uh, for us, which is really important to consider. Um, so moving on to the uh, circumscribed interests. Um, so as, as I mentioned before, um, all the circumscribed interests have been traditionally thought of as unitary uh, domains. 
Um, our recent work has suggested that there is a clear distinction between what we refer to as restricted interests. So the interests that, as I mentioned, are characterized by high intensity, but otherwise focus on usual topics, and unusual interests that are characterized by focus on topics that are not salient outside of autism. For example, traffic lights, timetables, and things such as like that. Um, to provide some support for uh, why it's really important to make a distinction between these behaviors um, is that we can look at how uh, whether they're uh, differently related to developmental, cognitive, or clinical correlates. So um, on this slide and the next two slides, on the right-hand side, you can see restricted interests, and on the left-hand side, you can see unusual interests. So as you can see, they're all, almost a mirror image of themselves. So uh, restricted interest is associated with um, higher with older age. Um, unusual interests are associated with younger age. Um, likewise, um, um, restricted interest are associated with higher IQ and um, uh, unusual interest with lower IQ. And finally, um, they also show um, the opposite association with severity of social and communication difficulties. Um, so what are the what are the potential mechanisms behind these um, uh, this type of um, repetitive behaviors? Well, um, unfortunately, um, this group of repetitive behaviors is the least well characterized in terms of the mechanisms. But there is some evidence um, and quite strong evidence that they're related to poorer executive functioning. So ability to inhibit response and shift to another task. Um, there are also several studies that have shown that they're related to anxiety, although it is still not clear whether people might be uh, engaging in this um, interest as a way of reducing uh, or alleviating their anxiety, or whether anxiety might be a consequence um, of uh, individuals uh, being precluded for engaging in their interests. And finally, um, there is some imaging work and some uh, eye tracking work that seems to suggest um, that restricted interests are associated with atypical reward processing. In other words, um, because people uh, tend to find non-social stimuli more rewarding than social, um, they tend to prioritize um, restricted interest over engaging in social, um, social communication interactions. So that's that's one of the that's one of the additional theories. And some of these um, hypotheses uh, tend to be um, supported uh, by the imaging findings. So we find structural and fa functional um, atypicalities both in the circuits that underpin executive functioning and cognitive control, but also in ventral striatum and orbital frontal cortex um, that are involved in reward and motivational processes. Um, however, what I would also like to emphasize when it comes to um, restricted and also unusual interest is that it's really important to consider context and whether these behaviors negatively impact a person before intervening. Um, so we know that um, across a few interventions, um, if a child has a particular restricted interest, they can actually be used as a, as a reward quite effectively. Um, to, um, to enhance child's ability to complete some other tasks. In addition, um, engaging in restricted interests, in certain restricted interests, has also been shown to be related to expertise. Um, so some people um, can actually use restricted interests to develop expertise in a particular field, which can then be related to um, higher probability of uh, gaining employment and being successful in education. Um, so it's important to, to consider um, the, the positive effects um, before, um, before um, intervention is considered. On the other hand, um, some of these behaviors can actually be extremely inflexible um, and can also be extremely time consuming. Um, since some, some cases people would uh, pursue their interest at the cost of everything else. Obviously, in those situations, it's important to consider um, managing um, the intensity of this um, interest. Um, so not, not completely um, 
reducing them, but just uh, reducing them to the point where um, they affect person's functioning to lesser level. Um, and finally, um, I would like to just uh, spend a few minutes um, uh, touching upon the assessment. Um, so I'll, I'll try to be as brief as possible and I'm happy to answer any questions at the end. Um, so when we're talking about assessments, um, given that repetitive behaviors are core diagnostic feature of autism, um, they obviously tend to be captured by the most widely used diagnostic instruments, um, such as autism diagnostic uh, interview revised, an autism diagnostic observation sh uh, schedule or ADOS, um, and also diagnostic interview for social and communication disorders or DISCO. Um, they also tend to be captured by um, quantitative severity measures, such as a social responsiveness scale or SRS, and social communication questionnaire or SEQ. Um, in addition, um, there is a range of uh, what we call dedicated repetitive behavior measures, so measures that have been uh, designed specifically to capture repetitive behaviors. And you can see some of these measures on the slides here. Um, so the question is, which, which of the measures should be used um, you know, in, in a clinical practice or in a research context? So this really depends on the purpose of either assessment or the purpose of the study. So what I would like to emphasize that in general, with the exception of a DISCO, which is a stands again as for a diagnostic interview for social and communication disorders, um, other diagnostic instru autism instruments have a pretty poor coverage of different repetitive behaviors. Um, as a result, although these instruments are obviously very good for establishing diagnosis, um, because their, their uh, sampling of repetitive behaviors is poor, and not detailed enough, um, they can lead to important repetitive behaviors being missed, which is obviously an issue um, in particular with regards to treatment planning. Uh, further, um, majority of current diagnostic um, uh, instruments uh, have poor sensit sensitivity to change. In other words, uh, they were not designed to be able to uh, capture change due, uh, due to the treatment. So if if our intention is to monitor whether um, our treatment for a given person is effective, um, we might actually miss uh, significant improvements if we are using the tools that are not um, suited for this purpose. So in general, um, using measures such as ADOS or ADAR um, is great and uh, highly encouraged for the purpose of diagnosis but if our purpose is to specifically capture um, the breadth and depth um, of repetitive behaviors, um, especially to inform treatment planning, um, they're, not, uh, they're not the most optimal approach. Um, much more optimal approach is to use what I mentioned before, um, is dedicated uh, repetitive behavior measures. So I listed some of them here, um, and I also put... Um, uh, how good coverage they have for uh, some of the main types of repetitive behaviors um, that we know are clinically important. Um, so um, I'm happy to share the slides and happy to answer any questions. Um, but um, I uh, thank you for your attention. Um, and again, happy, happy to, looking forward to the chat at the end. Um, and now, um, it's um, it's really great pleasure to um, to introduce uh, Professor Rogers. So uh, Professor Rogers is a professor of psychology and mental health, um, and she's an autism researcher in the Population Health Sciences Institute at University of Newcastle. Um, she leads a highly internationally recognized program of work that aims to understand structure, um, mechanisms, and assessment of uh, different aspects of mental health. Um, in autism, um, in particular anxiety, and she has done really great work on repetitive behaviors, uh, in particular developing um, a parent group intervention. And I was quite lucky for her to be involved in some ways in my PhD. So that was so it's always a yeah it's always a pleasure to um, to work with her on any of the projects. So I'm looking forward to um, to hearing her presentation as well. Thank you, Mirko. Um, I'm hoping you can hear me okay. Um, please let me know if you can't. Um, it's a real 
real pleasure to be here um, and to be talking to you this afternoon. Um, and I'm just about to share my screen so we can get things get things going. Okay. Okay, so hopefully you can see my screen now. Um, so I'm going to be picking up on some of the um, issues that Mirko has already um, spoken about a little bit um, today around restricted and repetitive behaviours. And my focus today is really going to be on when and how and if we ought to intervene um, in repetitive behaviours for autistic people. So before we start talking about repetitive behaviours specifically, I, I just thought it might be useful for us to kind of step back a little bit and, and think a bit about what it might be like for an autistic child or an autistic adult living in what is essentially a neurotypical world, a world that isn't designed for them and isn't necessarily always inclusive and accessible for them. We know um, from research and clinical practice that autistic people, including autistic children, are frequently misperceived and misunderstood by the neurotypical majority and, and vice versa. Um, and this is known essentially as the double empathy problem. We know possibly as a consequence of this that, for example, autistic children are more prone to experiencing a series of difficult life events. And that includes things like bullying in school, social exclusion and isolation and loneliness. And all of these factors are going to contribute to poor mental health um, and may prevent autistic people from developing to their full potential, which is often considerable. Um, as a consequence of, of these circumstances, um, autistic children or adults may respond or indeed be encouraged to respond um, by hiding their autism specific styles of social interaction and their restricted and repetitive behaviours to perhaps mimic the social interaction style and the repertoire of the neurotypical majority. And this is often called camouflaging or masking. Um, now, we know that camouflaging and masking can actually be detrimental to mental health, and there's lots of um, evidence now that um, chronic masking or camouflaging has a significant impact on well-being for autistic people. So I think it's important to frame our discussion about whether or not to intervene in restricted and repetitive behaviours within that context, because I, essentially, I guess, what we could argue is that by intervening with repetitive behaviours, we're encouraging people to um, inhibit their natural autistic tendencies or traits, and we're actually perhaps communicating to those individuals that these traits and these behaviours are not acceptable to the neurotypical majority. So I think we just need to frame the, the discussion that's going to come in that context and, and perhaps take a more nuanced approach to decisions around when to intervene and when not to intervene than perhaps we have as a community taken um, previously. In thinking about all of this, I, I really believe very strongly that it's important that we include the voices of autistic people um, in any decisions we make about the support and the care available to them. So what do autistic people tell us about their restricted and repetitive behaviours? Well, there's a burgeoning research now, um, which is co-produced with autistic people and led by autistic people um, to actually help us to understand the experiences of restricted and repetitive behaviours. Much of this research from the autistic community indicates that in many contexts, restricted and repetitive behaviours may be functional and helpful to the individual, and they may actually increase opportunities for socialisation through the, um, the sharing of interests and the sharing of expertise. And they are now framed, I think, and seen as a very important aspect of neurodiversity. A really interesting paper was published a, a short while ago by um, Ailsa Russell and, and colleagues um, from uh, Bath University in the UK, in which they interviewed a number of autistic adults about their experiences of repetitive behaviours, and they undertook a thematic analysis of these data, and four key themes emerged from those data. 
just as Mirko has already mentioned to you, um, autistic people describe to us that uh, restricted and repetitive behaviours may indeed help with their self-regulation and their emotional regulation. They may also have positive impacts on life and develop, provide the opportunity for the development of expertise and shared interests. But they did also identify a number of negative impacts, including um, difficulties um, when access to special interests, for example, may be restricted and that being anxiety provoking and or the responses of others to the presence of restricted and repetitive behaviours, which may then lead to a decision to try and suppress those behaviours and the negative consequences associated with that. The adults who took part in the study also suggested that um, we ought to try and um, structure support around restricted and repetitive behaviours for autistic people. That doesn't just take a very simplistic approach of trying to kind of um, reduce the expression of these behaviours in a very kind of medical model way, but we ought to take a more sophisticated and nuanced approach um, to this field and think about providing support that maximises the positive impacts of repetitive behaviours, whilst at the same time trying to reduce any negative impact. And very importantly, they highlight to us that we need to think very carefully about the impact of suppression, camouflaging or masking or, or however you want to describe it on mental health and functioning of autistic people. And these messages are really kind of echoed in this paper um, by Stephen Cap um, from the UK, which focuses specifically on experiences of stimming or kind of repetitive motor behaviors um, by autistic people. And again, um, research undertaken with the autism community to try and um, unpick what the positive and the negative aspects of, of stimming might be. And here that the team developed a model which actually indicates that stimming can actually be a really helpful process to manage kind of uncontain uncontainable emotion as they describe it. So in other words, to help with emotion regulation. If our strategies, therefore, are to try and inhibit or prevent people from actually engaging in these behaviours without providing an alternative way of managing emotions, then that could lead to really significant distress for the individual. So I think we need to think really carefully about this. Some work from our group um, in, in Newcastle with autistic adolescents where we interviewed um, young people to find out from them um, what they understood about the role that restricted repetitive behaviours um, may have in their lives. Again, follows the same pattern of, of information. So these are some quotes from the young people which really illustrate um, that the repetitive behaviours they were engaging in helped them to feel calm, um, got rid of a lot of energy for them and helped them to kind of organise and kind of um, manage their thoughts. So given that we um, are becoming more aware of the negative consequences of suppression and masking, and we are becoming more familiar with listening to the voices of autistic people and what they believe um, their autistic, their restricted and repetitive behaviours provide them with. Should we intervene or not in the presence of repetitive behaviours, I think is a really important question for us to consider as researchers and as clinicians. Now, we know that there are many autistic, the many restricted and repetitive behaviours that can confer pleasure and can um, and allow the development of expertise and, and the growth of social opportunities. But alongside that, as Mirko mentioned, there are some repetitive behaviours that can cause difficulty for the child, the person and their family. And the presence of these behaviours may make it difficult to complete or, or you know, engage in everyday activities that are necessary to, um, to functioning. They may also interfere with the child's learning. They may reduce opportunities for participation. And indeed, some restricted and repetitive behaviours may actually place the child at risk of physical harm. And so one of the questions that we advocate as a, as a team, both as clinicians as research and researchers, is to very clearly ask the question when looking at a particular child and the behaviours that they're engaging in, is this behaviour causing harm to the child? The parent may find it distressing because it's a behaviour that's not necessarily neurotypical and it's not something that they may be expected their child to engage in. 
But often it's the case that once parents begin to understand the role that repetitive behaviours may have for their child, they're more able to accommodate those behaviours into family life as long as those behaviours aren't harmful. So what we would have a discussion with families about is whether or not the behaviour that they are seeking support for is one that is harmful to the child. So given this kind of background, it's important for us, of course, to look at the kind of published evidence to see what the research base is telling us about interventions for restricted and repetitive behaviours. And I think, as Mirko's already alluded to today, um, the evidence base is, is quite um, is quite sparse at the moment, um, and there's a lot still to be done to understand um, how and when we should intervene with these types of behaviours. And I think in comparison with the social communication difficulties that autistic um, people experience, the research on restricted and repetitive behaviours is much um, smaller and, and much more kind of um, the forgotten symptom, if you like. Um, as a consequence of that, if you look at the early intervention literature, um, restricted and repetitive behaviours are, are often not specifically targeted in early intervention studies, which tend to have more of a focus on social communication difficulties. And when they are targeted, a lot of the uh, research that's done isn't really differentiating between those behaviours that are potentially harmful and those that aren't, but is taking more of a kind of very broad brush Kind of blanket approach. In addition to that, the research studies looking at interventions for repetitive behaviours tend to be based on very small sample sizes um, and there's very little evidence from kind of large samples and randomised controlled trials to provide us with convincing and robust evidence of the usefulness of any particular approach. Similarly, if you dig into those studies that have been um, published, uh, looking at um, interventions for um, restricted, and re restricted and repetitive behaviours as part of a kind of uh, wider early intervention approach, often um, the interventions that are described and not manualized and therefore it's very difficult to replicate findings it's very difficult to communicate the nature of those interventions to clinical teams for example so it's really hard for us to know therefore as a research community what might be helpful and what is less helpful in supporting families to reduce the impact of harmful repetitive behaviors i think we're quite a long way from being able to answer those questions adequately for, for families at the moment our research um, in Newcastle is very much focused on incorporating um, parents into um, interventions for restricted and repetitive behaviours for autistic children. And we've been involved um, re uh, recently and we're just about to um, finish a large trial. This is the pilot trial um, you can see here on the screen. We're about to, to um, publish hopefully a, a randomised control, fully powered trial looking looking at an intervention called Managing Repetitive Behaviours. Um, and that's an intervention which is very much focused on trying to work with parents to develop their understanding and knowledge of repetitive behaviours to identify and differentiate between those behaviours that are potentially harmful for their child and those that are part of their child's autism, but they're not actually harmful. And to seek um, strategies to, to work with, with that family to reduce the impact of those harmful behaviours. So very much taking a more nuanced approach to interventions um, for repetitive behaviours. The evidence base also tells us a little bit like the kind of assessment um, evidence base, I think, that conceptual frameworks are really needed in order for us to kind of move forward um, in the field. So this is an example of a conceptual um, model that was produced um, a couple of years ago, and I think it's really one of the only uh, one of very few conceptual models for early intervention in restricted and repetitive behaviours um, for autism. Importantly, um, it, uh, it it emphasises that we need to identify when an intervention is warranted. And as Mirko's already alluded to, sensitive measurement tools are really at the core of this work. And there's a lot still to be done um, on identifying the best ways to assess restricted and repetitive behaviours and change in those behaviours over time out with normal developmental change um, for autistic children. <laughs> 
I just wanted to finish today um, by just taking you through some potential tips for parents and caregivers. We're often asked as a, as a clinical academic team, um, how do we address difficult or challenging or harmful repetitive behaviours um, for autistic children? Um, and, you know, from a clinical perspective, I think there are things that we can advise at the moment, you know, with all of the caveats about the research evidence um, borne in mind. Um, often restricted and repetitive behaviours can emerge in response to difficult aspects of the child's environment. And so it's really important to try and support families to look at the environment or the setting in which the child's behaviour is occurring. And our experience is that parents are actually really good at this and they can use ABC techniques and STAR techniques in order to try and disentangle what's happening in the home or, or in their, their family life. And once they're able to do that, um, then it's possible they may be able to make adjustments to the environment that, for example, may minimise any unpleasant um, sensory stimuli that the child is finding aversive, may reduce the number of people in any given context if it's a social challenge that the child is experiencing or indeed increase structure and um, through the use of timetables or schedules um, and maintain routines where possible if difficulties with change and unpredictability and uncertainty um, are being experienced. And often, you know, taking parents using um, diaries or star techniques, they can become very skilled um, at this type of technique. Restricted and repetitive behaviours can often um, present in a form of communication for the child, particularly if the child uses few or no words. And so actually trying to focus on improving the child's ability to communicate might have a downstream impact on restricted and repetitive behaviours. And we've seen that in the recent PAC trials in the UK. It's also important for us to consider how we communicate with the child so that we're not um, increasing their anxiety or stress through clumsy um, or you know complicated communication and think about what the child may be trying to communicate through the engagement in in their repetitive behaviors so they're using non-verbal communication to indicate pain or distress or anxiety visual support such as clocks and timers and the use of simple language of course are, are all advocated in this context We've already touched upon the relationship between re restricted and repetitive behaviours and sensory sensitivities for autistic people. And just as we saw in Stephen Capp's study, stimming uh, may be a really useful way for a child to regulate their sensory system and or their emotions. Um, and of course, if that is the case, then what we wouldn't want to do is just to dampen down that behaviour without providing an alternative to that behaviour. And indeed, in some instances, maybe we don't want to do that at all. And actually, we need to learn to accommodate stimming. However, if the child is biting or hitting to gain sensory input, then it's clearly important to provide alternatives that meet this need that are not potentially harmful. So formulating what that behaviour is can be super helpful um, in this context. Again, as Merkel's already mentioned, there is a relationship between repetitive behaviours and emotional experiences. And some autistic people tell us very clearly that they engage in repetitive behaviours to manage or regulate their emotions, including distress, anxiety and frustration. This may be a consequence of the fact that autistic people find it difficult sometimes to identify their emotions um, and the bodily sensations and the physical cues associated with them. Um, and so therefore actually doing um, engaging in emotional literacy work may actually in and of itself reduce the reliance on repetitive behaviors as an emotion regulation strategy. And then the child can then be supported to try and develop an alternative way um, to make them feel calmer and safer if the repetitive behaviours that they are using to manage their emotions are potentially harmful in themselves. So I just wanted to share with you finally a couple of examples of children who we've worked with in our team. The names have been changed, of course, but the, the examples are very real, uh, real world. 
Um, so this is a little boy called Daniel. And Mum tells us that every, morn every morning, Daniel makes his trains with his blocks. So he lines his blocks up all around the room and in the hallway. It's a really extensive activity that takes lots and lots of time. And he won't do anything else until he's made his train. He won't eat his breakfast, he won't get dressed, and he's often late for school. And as a consequence of this, parents have tried to kind of intervene and stop him doing it. And it's very frustrating for the family. And it's also potentially harmful for Daniel because when they've tried to intervene previously he's become very distressed he's thrown his blocks um, and he's tried and he's hurt himself and his siblings as a consequence of that um, so we were working with the family to try and think of possible strategies for this and first of all trying to formulate what it might be about for Daniel and why he needs to do this um, and thinking about kind of executive function difficulties that he's experiencing but also maybe anxiety about the morning routine and actually going to school um, which seemed to be an issue for him. Um, parents um, started to introduce a timer with a time limit which seemed to be successful and they could put it say you can do this for a certain amount of time and then it's breakfast time and they used a visual timetable to show him what was going to happen next because he used to forget every morning and so it was very anxiety provoking to know what the morning held um, and these small steps um, really helped to achieve a new morning routine, which took a number of months to implement. But actually, over time, they reduced the distress that Daniel was experiencing in actually spending less time playing with his trains. Joe is a slightly older young man whose family we worked with and, and Joe had lots of sensory interests and he liked to stroke and smell people's hair and he would go up to strangers in shops and in cafes um, and engage in this behaviour and he did it at home, he did it at school, pretty much everywhere. He could be stopped very briefly from doing it but he would then go back to do it um, and he had often ran off in shops and started to touching the hair of strangers um, and this really placed Joe at risk as he was getting older and the family were really worried about this. So we worked with the family to think about the reasons why Joe may be engaging in this behaviour and his sensory needs around that behaviour and what he was experiencing as pleasure um, from that behaviour and thought about how that might be replaced with a, an activity or a stimulus that was less risky for Joe. And they identified a number of tools and a number of different types of materials that he actually then was able to enjoy. And he used to carry a backpack around with them with these materials in, which reduced his need to do this um, with strangers. So they're just a couple of examples from our clinical work um, of the ways in which you can work with the family to try and not eradicate the behaviour, but actually reduce the impact of the behaviour if it's potentially harmful for the child. Acknowledging that repetitive behaviours are a part of autism um, and, you know, and, and a valid part of, of that um, condition. Of course, when thinking about intervention, um, timing is everything. And at times of uncertainty and disruption, um, repetitive behaviours may increase as a consequence of um, the anxiety that the person may be experiencing at that moment. And this may be a, a temporary increase, um, but if that is the case, it's probably more important to address the anxiety rather than remove the restricted and repetitive behaviour. And at these times of uncertainty and disruption, which I know we've all been through over the past um, few months and years, um, some predictability will be really important for children. And so focusing on making them feel safe and making them feel um, contained may be more important than engaging in, in interventions to reduce their repetitive behaviours. So in summary then, uh, requiring autistic people to fit in and mask their autistic traits may place them at risk. So any decisions about whether or not to intervene in restricted and repetitive behaviours need to be thought about in that context. And autistic people tell us that their repetitive behaviours can be helpful and pleasurable. So it's really important we don't pathologise their passion, but we work with them to try and reduce the impact of the negative consequences. And we focus on those behaviours that are actually conferring risk. The evidence base on what to do is somewhat weak at the moment in terms of interventions and requires a conceptual framework, better measures and larger samples, and more detail of the interventions used, and a focus on the development of parental understanding. But in the meanwhile, there are kind of, you know, more kind of low scale clinical um, interventions that we can develop working in partnership with families and, of course, with autistic people. <laughs>
Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Mirko, and thank you, Dr. Rogers. So now we're going to um, go through the Q&A section. Daria, will you be reading the questions, or do you want me to do it? Uh, yes, I can read. Okay. I think we have to start from the Ukrainian one. So which repetitive behavior can be in uh, three and 3.7 years old child? Um. Yeah, it's a, um, it's a bit, the, the two things we have to consider, uh, so the, in children with autism, the age, chronological age doesn't necessarily always correspond with the, their actual level of development. Um, so there might be some discrepancies there, but if you presume that their developmental level corresponds with the chronological age, uh, we can actually expect quite a broad spectrum of repetitive behaviors that can be seen. So, for example, um, we can see pretty much all the motor stereotypes um, that you know I've shown on the slide. So we can see um, hand mannerisms, we can see rocking, we can see some of the stimming behaviors. Um, the motor development is obviously not completed at that point, but kids can still run around a little bit, so they can show some of the jumping and things like that. Obviously, not as complex as some of the older children can. In terms of the insistence on sameness um they can obviously be a level of rigidity for sure they can that can be observed um unusual sensory interests can certainly be very 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 present um and they usually are especially behaviors such as uh, observing certain objects for unusual from unusual angles or like for example wiggling figures on the sides um and uh, also um depending on the language level sometimes um, echolalia or stereo stereotype language can be present. And then finally, um, we can see um, some emergence of, uh, of uh, restricted interests. Obviously, given the cognitive level, they can't be as, um, as complex, but we can see, you know, for example, fixation on certain toys or fixation on certain teams or certain games. Um, so like long story short, <laughs> Um, we can see quite a wide spectra of, of repetitive behaviors. Um, but this is presuming that the child's developmental level is tracking their chronological level. Obviously, if the child's developmental level is lower um, or the child has intellectual disability, um, obviously the, the range of behaviors that we can see would be um, less broad. Thank you. Uh, another uh, translated question. How do we help kids with RRB in the school setting? The RRB shows and are uh, as running and jumping, which could be distracted to the classmates. RRB is high suspected, uh, triggered by social and school anxiety. I'm happy to, to try and answer this, Mirko, or at least start and you can help me out. Um, this is a really common um, question that we have, um, and often you see restricted and repetitive behaviours in school settings at particular times of the day. It depends a little bit on the school also, on whether the school is a specialist autism provision or whether it's a mainstream school. Um, Mainstream schools tend to be a bit more unpredictable, a bit more chaotic, a bit more noisy. They've got lots of sensory issues. And, and for autistic children in that context, repetitive behaviours may increase as, a, as the, um, the person says, as a response to anxiety. In specialist provision, often the classes are calmer and smaller and the teachers have more skills around autism. And yet even so, at particular key points in the day, we will often hear that, that children are more likely to engage in repetitive behaviours that may um, disrupt the classroom environment, particularly at transition points. So changes in activity or changes from one classroom to another or you know, at the beginning of a, a recess or the beginning of a lunch break. Um, and I think the observation that these behaviours are often related to anxiety is very key here, uh, because in order to um, 
support a child to perhaps engage in fewer of these behaviours, I think we need to think about how to tackle their anxiety. If we just try and dampen the repetitive behaviours, that may actually increase the anxiety the child is experiencing, and then that's going to backfire and the child will engage in more disruptive and repetitive behaviours. So I think formulating what's happening for the child at an individual level and, and what about those moments in their environment might be anxiety provoking and trying to provide, provide the child with alternative strategies to manage that anxiety will be key. And here we're seeing repetitive behaviours as a strategy the child is using <laughs> consciously or unconsciously to try and manage their affect. And so that's where we need to start. And I think that's what we would advise, um, you know, from a clinical perspective is to think about what's causing the anxiety, try and reduce that. And at the same time, try and increase the child's skills and provide them with alternative strategies to manage their anxiety. And you might then see a reduction in their engagement in repetitive behaviours. Thank you. Next question. Uh, why do such repetitive behaviours happen? I think we, you, you, you answered, but maybe you can add something. Um, just the uh, repetitive behaviors in general or, or any specific uh, one? Yeah, I, I think that because that, that, that was all uh, question. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, uh, we, we would like to know as well, but I think to, just, to, um, just to kind of very quickly recap, I guess there are two key, key elements there. Um, the the one, one key point is that repetitive behaviors are actually very complex. So although we usually refer to them using one name, um, as um, I, I covered in, in, in the lecture, we actually really have to think about them as, as a set of behaviors that are quite different and that actually might have different mechanisms. Um, and those mechanisms are obviously then related to different ways of supporting children. So what we um, know fairly well at this point um, is that insistence on sameness behaviors uh, or insistence on sameness and rigidity and inflexibility tends to be related to um, high levels of anxiety um, and some levels of delays or um, impairments in uh, different aspects of self-regulation. So both cognitive regulation such as ability to inhibit response and shift uh, mental sets, and also ability to regulate emotions. So that's something that um, um, we, we have done, uh, people have done quite a bit of work. Um, the other aspect is that we know that, um, as Professor Rogers has mentioned uh, in her presentation, is that um, repetitive motor behaviors um, tend, to be uh, tend to be related at least to some extent um, or serve as means of regulating arousal um, and, se and sensory stimulation. So they can either serve as increasing arousal in, in the situations when child is under aroused or serving the other, um, the other end of the spectrum. So when, when child is very, or person is very stressed, um, extremely aroused, they can use some of these behaviors to reduce it. Um, and finally, um, as I mentioned, the uh, uh, restricted interests are something that um, is probably the least well understood. Obviously, there's an element as we all enjoy our own interests. So there's always the inherent reward. Um, and you know, the academics can kind of border on having restricted interests for sure. Um, but, um, but there's also element that uh, that inflexibility, when a person can spend the whole day just engaging in one interest if they're not interrupted, that's clearly we know now uh, related to their um, um, uh, poor executive functioning. Um, so ho hopefully that sort of answers the question a little bit. Thank you. Uh, one more question. Uh, where can find, uh, where can we find the studies about connection between RRB and anxiety? Yeah, there's a, um, there's a quite, quite a few <laughs> by now. Um, so I've uh, I've put uh, some of the screenshots in the um, in the presentation. 
So I don't know if people are able to access the slides, but if not, I'm also happy to, to send um, um, like a few PDFs that you can share with people who are attending. So that might be, um, yeah, that, that might be useful. Um, uh, yeah, there, great. There, we yeah, have, we be, have translated also. Yeah, great. Yeah, great. there will be, um, I think at this point there's, I think there's, we've done a meta-analysis. I think there's more than 12 studies, if I remember from a, off the top of my head. So there, there's a quite a few. <laughs> Okay, uh, so the next question is, do you have a study regarding a FRID and RRB among non-speaking autistic kids? Uh, should I repeat or you can uh, look at Q&A session because I'm on the street. <laughs> So I, I'm not aware of a study that's looked specifically at AFRID and restricted and repetitive behaviours um, amongst nonverbal children. It's a very specific group of young people, but I am aware from the work that we have done um, on restricted and repetitive behaviours that AFRID is something that, that is very um, common amongst autistic children um, and is often related to the presence the presence of a higher level of restricted and repetitive behavior so for for those um who aren't aware afrid is really kind of um very restricted diet um and difficulties with um you know with eating and and with um broadening the repertoire of, of food that that the child is is willing to eat it's a very new diagnosis and i think what we'll see over the next few years, hopefully, is some specific studies that are focused on on that domain because it's often a huge concern for families and, of course, can impact very significantly um, on the child's development. Um, and therefore, it is something I think we need to to understand a little bit more about. I don't know, Mirka, whether you're aware of any studies, but I I'm not aware of any at the moment. It's a, it's, it's something that needs moment. to be done, though. <laughs> Uh, maybe you can see the next questions also. Can you re read it, please? Because I'm in the hospital with my son. Oh, oh yeah, of course, of course. Um, so one, one there, there are two, there seems to be two questions I left. I can read so... it for you, Dr. Miko, it's okay. So oh, is the okay. insistence of say, on sameness the feature of every person on the spectrum or not necessarily? Hmm. That's a really good question. Um, so I think, uh, Two ways to think about it. So the first way is to think about how we establish the diagnosis. Um, so DSM uh, uh, describes four different types of uh, repetitive behaviors. So repetitive motor behaviors, insistence on sameness, circumscribed interests, and unusual sensory features. And for a person to get a diagnosis of autism, they only need two um, types of re uh, repetitive behaviors. So in theory, a person can be diagnosed um, without showing any level of insistence on sameness. So that's the first thing to note. So um, not necessarily. Um, also, the other aspect to think about is insistence on sameness is a very dimensional trait. Um, so um, a person doesn't have to have autism to be rigid. We all know people in our lives who are more or less flexible. Um, that is for sure. Um, so uh, there, there is one study that hasn't necessarily looked at um, frequency or um, prevalence, so to speak, of insistence on sameness, but they have looked at um, um, how insistence on sameness in children with autism changes over time. So they looked at children, um, around 400 children, if I remember correctly, um, between the ages of 6 and 11. Um, and so around 40% of children in their study um, showed what they termed as a mild to moderate insistence on sameness. So there is implication that those and their level of insistence on sameness remains fairly stable. Um, so one thing that you know we can kind of extrapolate from that study is that you know you, you can probably think about um, 20 to 30 percent of, of people with autism for who, whom um, sameness might not necessarily um, reach the level um, where they're considered as being concerning um, because um, um, as we mentioned a few times, um, 
a lot of these uh, behavioral patterns can be quite uh, adaptive. Um, and actually routines um, are, are quite adaptive in, in, in everyday lives because they reduce effort, make things easier, make things less predictable, may um, reduce our cognitive load, cognitive effort. Um, so th the only um, reason why they might actually become problematic if, uh, if, the, if a person becomes so routinized and so rigid, they're not able to, to adapt to any level of change. Um, so that's the best way to, to think about it um, uh, from, from, a, from a clinical perspective. Thank you for that. Uh, when shall parents and therapists interfere in repetitive behaviors of kids' teenagers? I understand when there is a danger to the kids' safety and health. I guess that's kind of, you know, at the heart of what we're all struggling with as, as um, academics and clinicians working in repetitive behaviours is, is trying to determine when it's appropriate to intervene and, and when it isn't. And, you know, we, I think, have developed our understanding a lot over, over the years in terms of now moving towards a focus on when, um, you know, when a behaviour is deemed to be harmful. Um, and of course, you need to define what you mean by that. Um, you know, and is it harmful to the family? Is it harm Is it perceived as harmful? So, so you know, that's not necessarily as straightforward and simple as it it might at first sound. I think, you know, and it's it's an individual view. I think born from many very very many conversations with autistic people. I think that's you know my view is we should intervene when we think that the behaviour is harmful. But if the behaviour is not harmful and it's not causing distress or difficulty for the child or the person or the adult um, on the spectrum, then we really need to think carefully about who the intervention is for um, and only intervene if we think that it, there is kind of potentially detrimental impact um, for the individual. Um, alternatively to that, I think we ought to be thinking about how we make autistic traits more accepted and included um you know within within our communities rather than trying to to reduce them but I, it's a complex issue i think and, and one i think we need to be very much guided by the autism community about thank you that's the end of the questions and i would like to thank you both for this very informative presentation and thank you everyone for attending and for joining us today we hope to see you at our future webinar um thank you thank you thank you